How will God judge your soul? This is Dive Deep. From the Diocese of Springfield in Illinois, this is Dive Deep, where we dive deep into our Catholic faith. It's a question that I know many of you have. Actually, if I'd ask God one question, that would be my question. How do you judge? I'm so thankful I don't have to do that. He's the one doing that. We got Father Peter Harmon. He's pastor of St. Anthony of Padua Parish in Effingham. He also holds a doctorate in moral theology from the Catholic University of America. So, you're our expert, Father Harmon, to tell us how God judges today. How are you? I am doing very well. Thank you for having me. <laughs> you're this welcome. is a great setup here. Oh, thank you. It's nice thank to you. be back and be a part of this. That's so. right. Uh, you've been in, you were in Rome for what? Eight years? Nine years. Nine years. Nine years. Now yeah. back in Effingham, uh, originally from Quincy. Um, and a little fun fact about Father Harmon and I: we randomly found out when I moved to Springfield 13 years ago. We are distant cousins. We third, are. third cousins. Right. I know the resemblance is, is uncanny. Right. I don't have red hair anymore. <laughs> Did you even? You never, never had red hair or hair. <laughs> um, now, Father Harmon, as, as I kind of teed this up, this is definitely a very interesting theological, um, deep uh, question. And it is, I think a lot of people have this in mind. I mean, obviously, we don't truly know how God judges, but the church at least kind of, you know, points us to some things. So we at least know, have an idea on how God judges. But first, I want to start with, you know, Catholics believe there are two judgments, actually. There's um, the particular judgment and then a last or final judgment. Explain the differences between the particular and the last judgment. Sure. So um, those of us who will not be around for the final judgment, those of us who will have lived, you know, our earthly lives and uh, will will die, uh, hopefully in God's grace and as believers uh, will face or will come to uh, God's entrance or the entrance by God's grace either into uh, the kingdom of heaven um, or hopefully not be alienated from him in the other place, or uh, need some type of uh, purification awaiting the heavenly kingdom. Uh, we talk about that right now. We, we pray right now, right, for the deceased. We pray, we say, for the poor souls. We have masses offered for them. Uh, we also, the church also canonizes people by the example of their holy life and that they're actually still active and interceding for us. So we believe that there are people uh, in heaven uh, we believe there are people waiting to get to heaven. Um, so that particular that particular judgment that, that we will all face at our uh, at our at our death, and that's that's like immediate, right? When you meet right. God, you kind of right. He lays it all out for you, and that's the particular judgment. Well, right. Th- I think this podcast is going to be filled with me answering a lot of times by saying, "Well, that hasn't been revealed to us yet, <laughs> but this is what we this is what we do believe, or what has been revealed to us." But that also, then the, you know, the earth will end one day, and the Lord will come to take back His kingdom. Um, Both St. Paul and uh, the book of Revelation tell us that uh, Christ is the one who will judge the living uh, and the dead, but he will also be the one to make the ultimate judgment upon uh, the world because he uh, has saved it and has saved us by his cross and resurrection. And so the book of Revelation even talks about the Father giving Christ this power. And at that moment, then uh, the world will end uh, and we will, you know, be brought then all together, we hope, in the kingdom of heaven um, and then yeah, then that's, that's the, the kingdom that still awaits in its perfection. And the, the catechism talks about then what is opened for us in that kingdom uh, to see God as he really is, will be before him, the things of our lives, you know, will be laid bare. We will have that perfect union uh, with the Lord. Now, I thought I've read that the final judgment, you'll actually see everyone else's lives at, at that point and that final judgment. Does is, is the church teach that as well? Well, I mean, right. You know, I mean, we, we, the Lord talked about these things in, in, so often in, in signs and in parables. And so he does say, right, everything that has been hidden will be known. Everything that you hear whispered will be, you know, revealed and screamed from, from the housetops. And so there will be, in a sense, what we don't see now because of the veil of our own human limitations and as well as our own sins and the sins of others in the kingdom of heaven, which is perfection. There'll, there'll be no duplicity. There'll be nothing hidden. But I, I would argue that we shouldn't live worrying about what someone might think about something we did when we were in the fourth grade, because we'll be looking upon the, the face of God, we'll be in union with him. And I think the other things, because it's the kingdom of perfection, aren't going to preoccupy us. I was, like better. <laughs> I was going to say, because I know when I've thought of the, the final judgment and I, and I keep, you know, I hear about how all of your sins will be in essence public, as you mentioned, I, I will, will essentially know, you know, eyes not seen, you're not what you just said as, as well. You know, I, I, 
I think as humans, we focus on the negative and we're like, well, shoot, like all my sins are going to, everyone's going to know everything, the bad thing I did. It seems like it's, it's focused on the negative and not the positive. But, you know, to your point, are you saying, well, even if that, if, if that is true, we're all going to be in heaven. So it's not necessarily. Well, remember that, you know, I, let me, let me give you this analogy. Uh, so a priest hears confessions and he hears the, the sins and the mistakes and the embarrassment and the shame of people. Um, when a person goes to confession face to face, the priest might know who that person is, right? Clearly, or know them, see them later. Um, and I can tell you, I think every priest would tell you that when we see someone who has confessed their sins or in the middle of their confessing it, um, our minds are not preoccupied with, well, that was a really stupid thing to do. You should be embarrassed about that. That's a terrible thing for a person to do. The, the love and the mercy of God overwhelms those things. And so it isn't like, oh, you're the person who, I mean, honestly, as a priest, I've never like met someone and go, oh, you're the person who does this bad and embarrassing and crazy thing. It's more like, yeah, you're a person who belongs to the Lord and whom uh, his redemption is being manifest. And so maybe that analogy of when we see even sin in the midst of forgiven sin in the midst of God's grace and, and put that in his power, it is that love and that power that is more overwhelming than those things that distract from his, from his love and his mercy. Well, I think that's a, that is a really good analogy that helps me because, yeah, I think some people will be like, you know, again, we think of our, our human minds of, of heaven. Boy, gosh, I'm going to be embarrassed by everything everyone else will know about my life. Um, and, you know, there is no sense of embarrassment in, in heaven because, of course, heaven is, is, all, is, all, is all glory. Yeah, I think a lot of these questions about judgment, and they're good ones, right? But they're going to be, they're kind, of, they're kind of hypothetical, but they're also with, you know, with our human mind and the inability to know both the vastness and the goodness and the power of God versus the things that we see or don't see or can know or can't understand or by our own weakness and sinfulness can't yet fully comprehend. And so some of these comparisons might be, well, we don't know that because we're not there yet and we do not yet have the mind of God. Excellent. Now, um, you, you mentioned, you know, that that final judgment, kind of everything is revealed. So does the church teach that we will at the end of at the end of the world and at that final judgment that we will know everything? And I'm not going to say, well, you know, are we are we like God? I know we're not we not we aren't God, but we do become like God, and and everything is revealed to us, and we understand, you know, that God has always existed, which always boggles my mind, and that eternity lasts forever, which of course sometimes boggles the mind, and and why this happened, and why that happened, and why God did this, and why God it, that that will all be revealed to us. Well, we believe that we're going to be you know, uh, incorporated into the very life of God, which is pretty overwhelming to think, right? So just put it in that context. If we're incorporated in the life of God, uh, then all the limitations that we know now won't, won't exist in the same way, right? What, what we can, what we, what we can fully grasp, what we can fully grasp and experience while still being ourselves, I guess there, that's a question that we're going to have to wait and see, but it will be this overwhelming, uh, incorporation into perfection, the perfection of God, and looking upon him face to face and enjoying that view where we don't want to take our eyes off of that. So I think that's even even knowing things that we don't have the power to know now, I'm not going to be looking at what you did to me in the eighth grade or what, you know, whatever, what happened, what, because I'm going, to be, I'm going to be hopefully looking upon the face of God and seeing everything through that lens. Now, of course, well, when we die and we see God face to face, I, we've heard this saying before. I know uh, authors have written about it. Dare we hope that all men are saved? And I think some of the thoughts there is if we live a horrible, sinful life and we reject God, that when we die and we meet God face to face, God's mercy and love is so profound that in that moment, we in essence have a conversion and, oh my God, gosh, God, I'm so sorry for, you know, offending you. And, and in that moment, again, his mercy just overpowers. And so there, there's the line of dare we hope that all men are saved. Unlike the fallen angels who, who had met God face to face and they literally rejected God. And then, of course, they're now banished to hell. Um, there's this, you know, I guess, opinion that you could technically hope that all men are saved. So, um, well, yeah, we believe, I mean, we, we believe that it's God's will that all be saved. St. Paul says that. So we're also praying in our lives that God, your will be done. So our lives should be a desire for that, a desire that all would be saved. But again, um, do, we, do, do, do you think though, that does the church teach and maybe the answer is we don't know, which I understand, but does the church teach that in that when, when you die, your decision has already been made. You don't get the chance of, I'll say that second chance of you meet God face to face, then you're like, oh shoot, yeah, God, sorry, I screwed everything up. Well, you know, I would answer that question with this question, with this statement, right? So people came to Jesus, right? Lord, 
are only a few going to be saved? And he didn't give us the kind of answer you're wanting me to give you. He said, <laughs> strive to enter the narrow gate. So we turn that question and the energy of that question around to, let me look at my life. How can I be more in union with you, Lord? Jesus is turning that question around from a speculative question to, are you trying to enter the narrow gate? But he does say, Many will try to enter and will not be able. So we shouldn't, and I think that there's two ways to answer your question that would both be incorrect. And one is that God's judgment is, is such that he's actually looking for a way to keep us out of the kingdom of heaven. Or that, well, you know, actually it doesn't really matter what you do because God is a merciful God. Either of those answers um, are incomplete in a sense because Jesus speaks in all the parables about judgment, which... And we, I don't know when you're going to play this, you know, we're in the Feast of St. Luke today, the, the great gift of the evangelist and all these parables, many about judgment and about the kingdom. Clearly, Jesus makes it very clear that how you live your life will affect how you will spend the rest of your, how you will spend eternity, right? But also that we should not be overly concerned about our brother and we should desire our brother to be saved. We should work for our brother to be saved, right? We should help our sister along the way. We should be concerned, but it shouldn't be that speculative judgment kind of way. It should be a way where, how can I help advance the kingdom in the life of this person? How can I witness to that? By beginning with myself and my energy is spent not so much worrying about who's gonna be there, but what I can do to get as many people there, I suppose, as I, as I can do on this earth. Is it okay that I, you know, I, I, I can speak for myself where I think, uh, you know, half of me wants to go to heaven and half of me just doesn't wanna go to hell. It, am, am I looking at my life wrong? I mean, I've, I've, heard, yes. it, I've, I've heard it said that, I've heard it said that, you know, 100% of you should go to heaven, which I, maybe, I'm, maybe I'm wording it the wrong way, but it's like, I guess I'm saying like half of mine of mine is like, heaven's great, but half of mine is like, hell sounds so bad, I just don't want to go there. Um, but you said that's almost, as Catholics, we shouldn't be necessarily thinking about hell, or we should be, all, I mean... Again, it's that human nature. We, we focus on the right. negative more than the positive. Uh, yeah, you should all want, all of you should want to go to heaven. And all <laughs> of you should want to avoid hell, right? Because, uh, you know, the confession says, because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell. But most of all, right, because I offended you, my God, which is because of love. So we should not operate our lives out of a motivation of fear. If that helps us choose the right thing versus the wrong thing, right? I mean, that happens in kids, right? A, kid, a child may not understand that he has to do this or that, but if he's, if he's in a sense knows that, gosh, there's consequences for what I do that is wrong, I'm going to choose to do what's right, even if it isn't for the most perfect reason. We're still imperfect. We're still children. So we should, we should if nothing else, want to avoid being, being alienated from God, which is what you know, the, the kingdom of hell would be, alienation from God, where God is not present, uh, where there is no hope. Um, I don't want that, no matter what the suffering might be, that itself, because of my desire to love God and to be with him, I would not want to face that because it's the absence of him whom I love. So it's, a, it's not so much that I'm afraid of what's going to come with hell, but the fact that hell is complete alienation and eternal from God, I don't want that. My life is not ordered that way. Hopefully no one's is. Uh, no one who actually has had any good experience of faith or of God in their life. But yeah, so maybe we are, we are children, so sometimes a motivation that is of fear or punishment will get us the right way. And if that's what it takes to keep us from doing something sinful, hurting ourselves or something or someone else, that's better than doing something that will hurt someone else or ourselves. But it's this union with God that I relish and that I would never want to be uh, uh, separated. So try our best to kind of mold our minds to the positive and not the yeah, negative. Right. <laughs> because, right, because remember, hell and heaven aren't uh, equal powers. Good and evil aren't equal powers that we have to somehow choose. It's just heaven and God and goodness are truth and, and beauty and perfection. And hell is just all the complete absence of those things, right? So it isn't like there, there's two kingdoms that are vying for us that are equal. No, there is one kingdom that's vying for us. God wants us. The choice for us to, to follow him and to accept his mercy will allow us to enter that way through his grace, through our response. Uh, but the, the evil and hell are the absence of that goodness, not their own power. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I'm gonna ask another question about the negative. Sorry about this. So explain the church's teaching then on if you die in a state of mortal sin, the church teaches you go to hell. Right. If you die in unrepented mortal sin, so that we would say, hopefully, obviously, you should always, you should confess all your sins. You should certainly um, avail yourself of the sacrament of reconciliation if you're aware of mortal sin. Um, 
Only God can judge us. Only God knows our souls. So, Andrew, there could be things that are objectively terribly sinful. Um, but if my conscience or my my spiritual life isn't well formed, even though they may be horrific, um, they may not be mortal if I'm not free or if I'm not don't have full knowledge of that. And so, to get too far into where someone has committed a mortal sin and what's going to happen to them. Yeah, if we die with unrepented mortal sin, then what we're saying is, I don't desire God. I've, I've sort of like turned myself away from that possibility. And because we are free and God has created us this way, because if we weren't free, we couldn't really love him and be in relationship with him. We'd be robots. Because we're free, God will not force his mercy and his love upon us. No matter how deeply he wants that, he, loved, he wants it so deeply that he sent Christ among us to take away our sins. So he wants it even more than we want it for ourselves, but will not, will not turn us around and pull us back to his face. He might put all kinds of things to say, turn around, <laughs> look at this, see this. Uh, but if we, if we choose um, for whatever reason, and I don't know what that might be, um, to really just not to look at that, he's gonna, he will have to allow us to walk our own path. Yeah, and I've, I've heard this analogy, so I want to get your reaction to this analogy. So um, imagine, you know, heaven is up on top of the mountain, hell is on the bottom. And it's kind of like wherever you're facing at the end of your life, that's that's where you're going. So if you live a life of goodness and grace and then you die, you're in heaven. And if you live a you know, mortal sin, you're facing hell. You know, you get the analogy. However, um, I brought this question up to the person I was discussing with and I, and I still, I, I kind of, I was, I was unsatisfied with the answer, so to speak, where... He's, I think of like, well, imagine if you live a, a life of complete virtue, you're, you're a tremendous guy, you're loving, you know, all that good stuff. And then you make one bad mistake. It's a mortal sin. So in that moment, you're technically facing toward hell at the bottom of the mountain and then you die. So in essence, is that person going to hell? On the flip side, someone lives a life of horrific sin and then on their deathbed flips and they're, they're facing heaven almost by sheer lack of luck. This guy died on his deathbed, had a conversion and this guy happened to get hit by a bus uh, the day he committed a mortal sin and bam, he's all of a sudden facing hell. And, and, and again, from, from my human brain, that almost seems unfair that th- this person would be going to hell and that person's going to heaven. Your thoughts. <laughs> my thought is you're going to be also equally unsatisfied with my answer okay. to this that's, as you were. That's okay. uh, remember, you mean, you know, uh, the, 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 the good thief was on the cross and he made a, an act of faith before Christ who promised him today you will be with me in paradise. So, we're not judged by what is fair. We're judged by better than what is fair. Like I, I, I'm, I'm big on, we talk about karma. Karma is not a Catholic thing. That's just, that's, you get what you, it comes back to you. We have divine providence. And in that divine providence is the powerful love of God and his mercy. So we have better than karma. We have providence and the provident love of God is that all would be saved who would accept it. So live your life by facing that mountain and you know, I don't know. Could a, could a person? I, anything's possible. But if a person lives his whole life in grace, why would he turn to commit that mortal sin? Or why would God allow him to die at that moment in his life? I think you're trying. You're kind of stacking the deck against God. Like, here's the thing, Lord, where your mercy can't be as good as you say it is. So don't 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 try to stack the deck for God in that way. Well, getting getting back to mortal sin, you know, do, am, am I on the way the right wavelength here? Where okay, if if you let's say you do live a very virtuous life. You you really know and understand the church's teachings. You believe it profoundly. And you do just have that moment where you're like, at that moment, you you reject God. And so you know you committed a mortal sin. However, even after you commit it, you're like, shoot, I just committed a mortal sin. I shouldn't go to, I gotta go to confession. I shouldn't receive communion. Even in that moment, you have a little bit of like, I know I committed a mortal sin, and but I know I screwed up. In essence, while- <laughs> I love the fact that you're gonna, you committed a mortal sin and you're only gonna say shoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> good, good point. Let, let, me, let me answer this. So I think that you're, you're talking about, you know, knowing the church's teaching and trying to live his grace and understanding it. I think you're maybe focusing a little bit too much on the orientation of the head and the intellect in this versus the orientation of the heart, which we're not going to want to separate. We're one being. But remember, it is my soul, not just my mind, right, that the Lord sees into and knows how and why uh, I, I operate in a certain way. So my, my orientation toward him I would think is going to is going to be a general way. That doesn't mean that mortal sin cannot enter into my life or that I could not be judged, but my heart is moving in a certain direction. I don't know why would I turn myself away from that? What's what's going to be in there even so I think you know that saying that I, I I die with unrepented mortal sin means my heart is pretty much 
closed off. I don't want this. And I, and I just freely and with knowledge and full knowledge committed this thing. I think that the person who's lived his whole life facing the mountain of goodness, his heart is going to be so less inclined to do that, that perhaps the theoretical of the mind is getting in the way of the, of the conversion of the heart. Do you, do you think in our judgment, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> you're laughing, I know. You're, you're a, come on, you got a degree in moral theology from Catholic University of America. That's why we brought you in. Um, is, is it a pretty equal of what good did you do in your life versus what, what, you, what evil and sin you did in your life? Well, I hope not because, I mean, again, go to the, the good thief on the cross. Go to the, go to the son, who the prodigal son who comes back. Even this um, just initial desire to return to God and let his mercy be at work was enough to be saved. Remember, and you know, I think you're asking from the from the uh, perspective maybe of the good son and the prodigal son who never did anything wrong. Someone's got to speak for right. him in this and so, podcast. And there, <laughs> and there is something very true, very something very human about that desire to uh, to want to stack these things up before the Lord and all these good deeds. Right, uh, the Pharisee who can say of himself, "Boy, I'm glad I'm not like this tax collector." Right, who I've I tithe everything, I fast. Um, I'm glad I'm not like him. I know the commandments and I worship and, and, the, and the tax collector just doesn't even bother to go towards the sanctuary, is at the back of the temple and just raises his eyes to heaven and says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And so don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that you shouldn't desire to know the commandments and live them. You should. And that you should try to offer your crosses and be a patient, loving and forgiving person because the Lord said, strive for the narrow gate. Uh, but that's his answer to how many are going to be saved. And we've seen in the parables where the Lord turns sort of our expectations upside down about his judgment, uh, the, in, the inclusion for that, but also not the assumption even for the righteous, right? So I like to say the difference between being righteous and being self-righteous. So we desire to be righteous, but never with an eye that, well, I'm glad I'm not like that person. I'm, I'm pretty, I feel pretty good about my Catholic faith. You should feel pretty good about your Catholic faith and you should strive to live it with everything, and you should not ever look back. But um, I, I can never, you should never use that as a comparison to, well, I've done more good than evil, so I should be on my way to, you know, the Jesus, the Lord isn't gonna be sitting there like in court. Don't treat your life like a scoreboard. Yeah, right. Whenever you keep score, you lose, <laughs> right? You just let God keep score. Whenever you keep score versus either someone else or yeah, whenever you keep score, you end up on the short end of the stick. Now, another thing I wanna get, to, get into, you know, the Bible speaks about nothing unclean will enter heaven. Um, I, I think some of us, you know, I, I sometimes have these, you know, these thoughts of like, oh, oh my gosh, you know, nothing unclean. Gaining eternal life immediately upon death almost seems impossible. Um, obviously, we believe in purgatory. So it, it, sometimes I think some people practicing Catholics almost think it's a foregone conclusion. I'm, I'm going to go to purgatory because it's just striving for perfection you can strive for perfection, but you'll never be perfect. The only per person who is perfect is Mary, um, and of course Jesus, who lived on Earth. So it's almost like, of course, I want to strive, and and but there's a little sense of despair there, where it's like, gosh, if nothing unclean will enter heaven, I've already sinned. Yeah, I've gone to confession, but that I still have that attachment, and getting to heaven at least on that first, you know, right away seems unattainable. Well, it's certainly unattainable on our own, right? It's only with God's mercy and His grace and His desire to uh, envelop us in his love. Um, yeah, I'm hoping for purgatory because I know my own weakness and my sins and I know, I know these things and gosh, I know I'm not worthy of this. Um, sometimes in speaking with, uh, with Christians who are studying the faith to enter the faith, you know, enter the church with the order of Christian initiation, you know, or people who are coming back to the church, the question of purgatory can be one that can be a sticking point. And I try to turn it around and say, no, actually, not that I'm looking forward to it, even though I may fully expect it, but I, we're going to need it because if, if I bring something that isn't perfect into heaven, then it's no longer heaven for you. I've tainted the pool, right? <laughs> so if we're going to live in heaven and in perfection, we have to be purged or freed or acknowledged or just purified of those things that stand in the way that we don't get, that we don't understand. I would say um, analogous to like landing in a foreign city and you go to the airport and to be able to leave the airport, I got to know something of the language or I'm not going to be able to survive. If I get off the plane and they don't speak English, I'm toast. So I, I've studied the language so I can, I can now be able to live here. Think about that as a light. The grace is sort of like trying to learn the language of heaven now. So when I get there, 
I'm aware of these things. They make sense to me. I have a desire for God. I'm humble. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiving. Um, those are like the language of heaven, the things of the language of heaven that we still need to probably work out. So we might need a little refresher when we get to purgatory. Uh, will the Lord reveal our sins to us? Maybe things we don't even know or how they've affected other people for us to be uh, free of that? Will the Lord reveal uh, how other people have hurt us? And we have to say, I forgive that person uh, as part of our purification. I don't know. I, those things would seem to make sense to me so that then I can enter that community of the saints, right? And be ready to be welcomed and, and get it and speak their language and enjoy that. And if I'm still holding on to something, I can't enter the party. It's no longer a party <laughs> if I come in there with these things that don't belong. I'm going to ask you a very specific question that, again, I probably answer is you don't know, but maybe you have some thoughts on this. Let's, uh, you know, dare we hope our loved ones are not in hell, but if we're in heaven and a loved one is in hell, would we know that being in heaven? Well, I would guess, I would guess so. Uh, I don't know how that, I don't know how that wouldn't then take away heaven from us. So that's a really, that's a good question. Again, it's a very, you know, kind of hypothetical one. Right. Uh, because if, if, if we, at, at the final judgment, if we know all, we would obviously know what other people did and if they're in hell. And of course the human reaction is, I, well, I wouldn't be fully happy in heaven yeah. because the person I loved is in hell. So I think because that's true, you can't really, that's a question, you know, can God make a rock he can't lift, right? So, <laughs> so, okay, he, so right, if he can't make it, he's not God. If he can't lift it, he's not God. Well, we're now we're kind of putting, we're kind of putting things around God that we can't really yet kind of guess about. Uh, pr yeah, pray, pray, I mean, I hope, I pray for your, for your loved ones now. Um, work for their conversion by your own example in your life so that the energy should be spent not worrying about that question so much as what, what am I doing now? What am I offering up? What am I teaching? How am I trying to lead someone? Um, yes, because I think that we do believe, you know, that if, if someone is in, in hell, then that's, there's, no, there's, there's, no, there's no door that goes the direction to heaven, right? So, um, you know, the rich man and Lazarus that, you know, Jesus says very clearly in that judgment, um, you know, there, there's a chasm here that cannot be, that cannot be changed, right? Can't be traversed. And so we believe the reality of that. Uh, we know God wants all of us to not be there, or actually to put it in the positive, he wants all of us to be in his kingdom. But those questions about what we know of hell in heaven, I don't know. Uh, again, we're, we're, we'll be oriented towards the face of God such that those things aren't, aren't hopefully caught up in our experience, because you're right, that would not be that wouldn't be enjoying the kingdom of heaven. But I, I don't know. We can't answer that question until we get there. And so I hope that when I get to heaven, you're, 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 gonna, you're coming soon. I appreciate you're that. You're younger than me, so I should hopefully get there first. <laughs> uh, but, we'll, we'll, finish, we'll finish with this one. So if you had to sum it up, and, and, and you know, if, if people are dwelling on judgment and dwelling on, on their life and things like that, I guess what's your overall message for people listening on, on you know, when they think about judgment and they think about the final days and the end of the world, what, what would you say to them? Take it very seriously, but don't worry, right? Take it seriously, but don't worry. In all the parables, the way Jesus taught us, he makes it clear that judgment is real. He makes it clear that there is a kingdom of the Father, and he makes it clear that we could also choose to go somewhere that uh, is, is alien to that kingdom. That we, can, we say the kingdom or the place of hell being um, deprived totally of that. But remember, in all the, what, what is woven through all of the parables about judgment is will be judged by how we how we try to live his commands, right? Um, how we have loved or cared for a brother or sister, right? Like beautiful, the way, the way St. Matthew sort of ends the gospel before they go in to Holy Week, you know, the judgment, you know, when did I see you hungry? When did I see you thirsty? That's how the sheep and goats will be separated. But then also by not judging others, right? So the three ways are living the commandments, uh, loving him, loving our brothers and sisters and, and caring for them and not judging others. He says, judge not, and you will not be judged. And the measure with which you measure will be measured out to you. Put your emphasis on the measure of love and goodness and faith, and that's where your treasure will be, not only in the kingdom of heaven, but you'll get a share in the fulfilling of your soul even now. The only tragedy in life is not becoming a saint. There you go. <laughs> Father Peter Harmon, great conversation. Thank you so much for coming on Dive Deep. We really appreciate it. Thank you. That is Father Peter Harmon. He is pastor of St. Anthony of Padua Parish in Effingham. This has been Dive Deep. If you'd like more podcasts, head over to dial.org slash podcast. You can also give to Dive Deep, dial.org slash gives. We can continue these podcasts. Until next time, we'll see you right here on Dive Deep. Dive Deep.